Good evening, everyone. It's 630, so we'll begin the Think Spring Gardening Series. I'm Nikki Keltner. I'm the program coordinator for the University of Illinois Extension in Stevenson County. Joining us tonight is one of my colleagues, Alex Burback. She's a program coordinator in Joe Davis County. She is co-host on the call. So if you need help with the Zoom call, please message Alex or myself using the private message setting in the chat box. If you have questions related to the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. We'll take time at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Reminder, the handouts for tonight's program were attached to the email that I sent out to you yesterday. So tonight we welcome Extension Educator Martha Smith, who is presenting on 50 Shapes of Shade. Martha's love of plants and gardening was instilled in her by her mother, who she worked with as a perennial grower while in high school and during college breaks. After graduating from University of Illinois with a Bachelor's of Science in Ornamental Horticulture, she worked in the green industry until hired as a horticulture agent for Cornell Cooperative Extension. Moving home to Illinois, she has worked for University of Illinois Extension since 1994. Along the way, she earned a master's degree in adult education. Martha is also a certified arborist. Welcome, Martha. Thank you for presenting to us tonight. We'll let you start your screen share. Okay, let's hope we can get this to work. Okay, what do you see? A black screen. <laughs> Uh, let's go with this and hit share. Now, what do you see? Yeah, it's, yep, now we see the right thing, Martha. Thank you. Oh, all righty. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for um, having me this evening. It's uh, always nice to talk about plants. It's <laughs> one of my favorite things to talk about. This program really is designed to get people to think about the, the plant itself, the overall shape and form of the plant, and then how we use that plant in the landscape. And hopefully uh, this evening you'll walk away with uh, maybe a, let's hope a different perspective on placing plants in their landscape and how they can work off one another. You know, when we talk about the form or outline of a plant, it really includes the three-dimensional mass of the plant. So you really have to look at the, the direction and arrangement of lines of the branches and twigs. Uh, here in this picture that you're seeing, um, you're seeing one of my favorite trees. The deciduous tree is in my front yard. That's a fern leaf beech. You're gonna see it in a moment. <laughs> you're gonna see that it's grown. And in the back, uh, a spruce that is a distinct, uh, more of a pyramidal conical shape versus the um, friendly beach, much more of a rounded crown. And the, we got the 50 shapes of shade because when I took this picture, it was on a sunny day, fresh layer of snow. And I really liked how the silhouette of that tree lands on the, on the snow. So really overall form is, more or less relevant, really depending on where you're viewing the, the tree. Uh, for example, a, a, a tree can look quite different if you're standing directly underneath it and looking straight up versus you are away and viewing that tree from a distance. So I should also say when we talk about shapes of plants, it's not, it's not exactly scientific because plants change, their forms can change as they mature. And for some of these, it's really uh, determined by the judgment of the viewer. So the handout that you have really goes through the basic shapes uh, and that's what you can follow along with with tonight's program. So plant shapes, here's that same tree. <laughs> it's, it's grown. 
uh, every tree is different. And tonight I'm, I'm concentrating on trees, but do realize this is also pertaining to shrubs because they also have shapes that we can add into the landscape. Naming shapes is really not an exact science, but in general, they tend to fall into categories. And so what we're gonna talk about are these common categories, and I'm primarily going to be presenting trees, but as I said, this can also be um, uh, shrubs. So here, this is the same tree that you saw before, just uh, an angle, you're looking at it from the street. Over here, this is Pinus strobus. Uh, it's a white pine, it's called Stowe's Pillar. Uh, there should be an S on that, Stowe. And it is an upright, narrow growing evergreen. The fernleaf beech, very much a rounded crown on the top and the bottom has somewhat a vase shape to it. And then over here, what we have is a globe blue spruce. So you're seeing evergreen foliage, you're seeing the blue of the uh, blue spruce, you're seeing the green of the Stowe's pillar, you're seeing the, that new look in the spring as the fernleaf beef beach is just leafing out. And also you're seeing the different shapes. You're seeing the upright uh, white pine, rounded crown of the beach, and then a low ground hugging rounded form with the um, blue spruce. Same tree, but now I'm looking at it from a different angle. Now I'm looking toward the street and I hope you're noticing that there's a lot of other shapes in the picture. So we see the crown of the Fernleaf Beach, but here distinct pyramidal shape of an Aves Concolor uh, compact, compacta. We have some low growing plants also. This is a low growing juniper called Dobbs Frosted. Uh, and just a, a combination of shapes and textures that makes that visually interesting. The picture on the right, <clears throat> a little closer, this is, this is the same front boulders, but now it's a little later in the season. This is the fern leaf beach. It's emerged, the leaves have just come out. And now the Aves Concolor is starting to kick out its spring uh, blue growth. So that pyramidal shape really is defined. And over here, this is a, um, a, a contorted beach. And I'm gonna talk about that one a little bit later. Uh, here we have a uh, weeping uh, fir. So again, lots of forms, lots of shapes, textures, and foliage colors. I have to put in winter because this tree is beautiful in the winter. Uh, you can see we have lights on it, it's illuminated and you really can see the, the structure to it. You can really see that shape. So here's another spot in the garden, a little bit different feel. This in the background is a um, Dawn Redwood. It's a Metis, oh, I apologize. It's a meta sequoia and it is called Gold Rush. And here in the front, what you're seeing is a Cornus Cusa or the Chinese dogwood. Cornus Cusa is known for a spreading hab crown and then these very strong horizontal branches. And here you see it in flower. It is a re relative of the uh, Cornus Florida, the common dogwood, but this one for us in the North is a little bit um, more bloom uh, dependent. It'll bloom uh, because it blooms later than your regular dogwoods. So if we do have one of those frosts that can wipe out the flowering dogwood flowers, this one comes in a little bit later. Here, this is the close-up of the Cornus Cusa flowers, and you can see that, that horizontal branching. Uh, this tree also has a great silhouette in the winter. It has that nice uh, uh, horizontal branching, but it also gets these fruits later on in the summer. So it is a really nice tree with multi-season interest. So tree forms. Um, 
there's there are several out there. These are the main classifications. And you can see, you know, some of them are going to be open to uh, your personal interpretation and also the age of that tree. But we're going to talk about each of these round, spreading, pyramidal, vase, weeping, and I'll give you examples of each. But there is one form that we never want to see this, okay? This is known as topping of a tree. Now, I know the reasons probably they did this, they probably thought it was the branches were getting heavy, they could fall on the house. They thought the tree was um, dropping too much litter and leaf and they found it messy. A tree genetically has an inherent shape that it is predestined to become, okay? So, Whatever it is supposed to form, that's what you need to expect, not trying to make that plant uh, conform to what you want. Now, the thing with, with topping of a tree is that tree was growing in proportion. It was growing a crown or a top portion that was in a proportion with its roots. There was a root to crown ratio. So now what they've done is they've eliminated a very large percentage of the crown, but you still have that root system expecting to support that crown that is no longer there. In the reverse, you no longer have a crown that that entire root system is dependent on. So remember the crown with the leaves, photosynthesis, they're gonna to travel to the roots. Every tip of that tree had a corresponding root. That's the whole vascular system that runs through. So now you no longer are going to be able to keep that root system um, healthy. You're gonna have some of the root system dying off because it's not gonna be receiving food and it no longer is able to send up all of the, the energy and food that it's stored. So it's really not something that we recommend. It really boils down to picking the right plant for the right spot. And what happens when trees are topped? Well, up here, they, where the cut was made, let me go back to the other picture. But right up here where all of these cuts were made, you have a large wound uh, that's going to take some time to heal. Right underneath the bark is the vascular cambium. And when this uh, happens, when a tree is topped, that vascular system will kick in and we have what we call adventitious buds. And they're gonna sprout because they, they're trying to survive. This tree is trying to survive. It has to be able to um, have foliage to photosynthesize and support itself. So what happens is we start to get these thin, wispy growths. You will never get that inherent shape of that plant again. Okay, so whatever that tree was supposed to form into, this is what you're going to end up with. And these are not strong attachments. They're not strong um, branches. They don't have the limb strength that was removed. So you also you tend to have weak connections. You can have more wind damage. A lot of these small little sprouts can pop off easily. And on here, this is just showing you, remember this is the, the, where it was cut. So this was just a large exposed wound. It's gonna take time to heal, but in the meantime, it's exposed to weather, rain, elements. And oftentimes this is what we see happening. We start to see a rot. Now over here, the tree was trying to grow. This is that vascular cambium, right? Where this cut was made. So this was trying to grow, but because the rot was taking in, it never was able to, to take hold. So it's something that we don't recommend. And if it's something that you're seriously thinking about, I would 
consult with an arborist and see what other um, avenues could be taken. Um, and really, you never want to top a tree. You never want to, because it'll never return to its shape. But we see these things. We see them. Um, this one was called Bad Hair Day, and I understand why. Um, when we talk about pruning, we have to understand there's pruning for a shape that we wish to have. Then there's pruning for safety and continuation of our services. So the picture on the right, I usually know when the city is going around and trimming their trees around their power lines because I start to get calls. Uh, is that attractive? No, but for continuation of service that we have come to um, expect on a daily basis and for safety issues, um, this is what needs to be done. So you might say, well, you know, blame the arborist, they did it. Well, no, I blame the person who put that tree underneath those lines uh, and not doing their research and realizing it was going to get large and it was going to interfere with those power lines. Um, so there's you know two sides to every situation, but when they're out, they're trying to keep us um, with the services that we expect and they're also doing it for safety. The one on the lower left, I know exactly what happened with this because it's pretty obvious. They had a, um, a juniper and it was getting too wide. So rather than expand this bed, which would have made this a much more attractive uh, planting, they just decided to cut the plant back to fit the edge of that space. Now with evergreens, junipers in particular, uh, they have what they call a dead zone. And that dead zone, once you cut into it, does not have the ability to rejuvenate new foliage. So here, if they were trimming it like they would a deciduous hedge, thinking, oh, we'll just get new growth, they cut into the dead wood and that's not gonna come back. So rather than just widening out the bed, they opted for this and this is what, what we're seeing. But then there's things where we can really uh, get a few workarounds with, with, with pruning and with shape. This was, I was on a perennial uh, plant association garden tour and this was really uh, quite innovative. As you can see that they, they don't have a lot of space here. They maybe have two feet to, before the fence. The garden on the other side, they wanted a visual block. They didn't want to see these lines, so they wanted this visual block. What they put in were narrow, upright beaches, beech trees. So they just keep them pruned up to the point where they want the uh, privacy. So it works. It, it absolutely works. They're not seeing the power lines or getting some privacy. And if they had not done that, these trees would be encroaching into this um, alleyway. But when we talk about pruning, you know, there's, it's all in the eye of the beholder. And uh, this actually with the house, with the structure, with the property, it worked, but that's a lot of work in itself to get it that meticulous and to keep it to that shape and form. But this is where we uh, humans are in, um, exerting our will onto the plants to what we want them to look like rather than choosing the plants for their inherent shape that we can then use in the landscape. Again, not your natural shape. These are U's. And um, I have to admit, whoever does the pruning on these, you know, kudos. They, they look pretty uniform. Maybe this one's a little bit shorter. But these would be considered uh, pyramidal. Um, some people might call them uh, um, a cone-shaped. 
And I like this picture. Uh, this was taken down in Macomb at Western Illinois University. Because here you have a pyramidal shape wider at the bottom, narrowing to the top. And then right here, these panicums are actually the reverse. They're wide at the top and narrow at the base. So I, I took this and I thought that's, that's interesting how basically these plants have the same shape, but they're reversed. It made a really interesting picture. So we're dealing with living things and living things change and mature over time. You know, I talked about, you know, when you look at a form of a plant, it really is dependent on where you're looking. I'm sure this oak, this majestic oak, looking at it right up against its trunk and looking up, it's, it's amazing. You know, you think about from that tiny acorn, the mighty oak did grow. And I'm sure if you stepped away from this tree from a distance, you would see, you know, have a much different, different feel for it in its spreading crown and its uh, majestic beauty. But it changes. We know that trees, as they mature, some will start out more columnar and open up. Some might stay pyramidal for years, but then open up. So I have a favorite quote that I use for plants. And that is, they're the slowest of the performing arts. Think about that. They are performing, they're changing in front of us. It's very slow and it's over time, but it is. So this is a picture in our backyard and we had this metal um, trellis built for us and we started an arch and we started it, planted it with a larch. So this is Larix decidua pendula or larch. And this was a couple, maybe the second year it was in, this was in the fall, uh, showing off its fall color. But here, this is several years later, and now it's really starting to take on that um, uh, pendulous feel that, that you get. So we, we have watched this slowly evolve over time, and it's still changing. Now, I have to be honest, that wasn't my original idea. This is a garden up in Fulton, Illinois, a friend of mine, Randy Dykstra, and that's his large arch. And he actually has it as the top of this gazebo-like structure. He doesn't have a, a top on there. He has his, his large arch, or he has very minimal structure under there. And I hope you can see in this picture the shapes of all the other plants, the textures, the colors, the contrasts, all of those are what makes a landscape visually interesting. So again, think about the shape and the form of the plants. And here, this, this happens, this happens, it's more common than you realize, drive around and you start to see it. Here I know, again, exactly what happened. They put these plants in uh, early on. They were the size that they liked and then they started to grow. So now in the upper right picture, okay, they're getting some size on the ends. It looks like they've got a couple of dwarf Alberta spruces in there. And then come back several years later and they've, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're reaching their, inherent genetic shape. And really, I think in this instance, it's kind of sad because it's the house has a very nice architectural look to it. It also looks like it has a very lovely bay window and no one can see it. And from inside that house, the sunlight can't get in, it might be dark. So do your research and try to select plants that will work in the situation that you're going to put them in and not trying to manipulate them. And yes, some plants in our front landscapes and our foundation plantings, we can prune them, but over time, they start to get very woody. They start to um, be more difficult to control. So, you know, a front foundation planting uh, doesn't mean it has to be permanent. 
I mean, those things, when they get to this size and they're no longer manageable, maybe it's time to think about taking them out and starting with something new. So let's talk a little bit about form. When you're dealing with trees and shrubs, I like it to be the first design quality um, that I want to consider. Because that's going to be what I am going to see. How do I want that to fit in my landscape? Form is the shape of the plant and how it's going to occupy and accent that space. And you don't want to have to depend on pruning to get that shape because you will be doing that for the life of the tree or the life of the shrub or for as long as you live in that house. And when we talk about plant forms, we very, very generically divide them in trees, shrubs, and ground covers. Um, but as I said, we're gonna be talking mainly about trees this evening. So the more extreme the form equals more attention. Now the picture on the right, those are weeping white spruces. And it is a very impressive planting with, with those. Uh, they are known to grow straight upright with these uh, weeping um, branches. Their bottom footprint is maybe in the beginning, maybe two, three feet across, but then as they grow, they start to form what we call a skirt around them. But the upper portion is going to stay upright and narrow. Picture on the right, again, is that larch, Larix decidua pendula. And here, they're just letting it do its thing, letting it form. Um, it looks like they might have thinned, oh, I apologize, thinned out the center. Okay? But they're letting those just be, and that's what's drawing your eye. So uh, this is a weeping white spruce. That's in uh, my backyard. And I'm a member of the American Conifer Society. And we all joke because every member seems to have to have this obligatory <laughs> weeping white spruce because we all have them. But I put this in because not only is it a, a focal point uh, for the growing season, it's also beautiful in the winter time. Uh, the seasonalities of plants can um, draw your eye and what you're seeing in the lower right is that um, larch in fall color. So you have this weeping, graceful, soft green in the summer, turns to this russet gold in the fall. They drop their needles. And then in the winter time, your silhouette is this pendulous shape. So the more extreme, the more attention you're gonna get. Um, this is sylvatica. That is a tupelo or a black gum. Pyramidal, nice pyramidal shape, very nice tree, native tree. Uh, here you see it in its fall color. And during the summer, it's just a nice glossy green, but a very distinct parameter. On the right, you see a beautiful oak silhouette. Just phenomenal how that, that picture was taken. Uh, try to imagine that topped where they've gone in and for some reason decided they wanted to give it a cut back maybe to here, that tree would never form, reform into this shape again. Weeping willows. Here, a weeping willow, we see them uh, during the growing season. Again, very graceful, green, um, pendulous. The fall, they often can take on a, a golden color. But wow, look at that one after a hoarfrost came in. I mean, that to me is just, just beautiful. Uh, and it has to do with, with the form of that plant, the direction and line that those branches are taking. So here, which do you notice? They're both relatively rounded crowns, um, but there's a green ash. And I again, I would not recommend a green ash right now. It's just the picture that I'm, I'm using. Nice rounded green form. You have a tricolor beach, nice uh, kind of conical rounded form, but with a foliage color. So what, what do you want in your yard? Uh, maybe a nice soft green like the ash, 
Uh, there's no right or wrong. It's, it's what you like, but just understand that your shapes, your forms also might come in different colors. So this is what your handout is all about. Um, we're gonna talk about these, uh, each of these, and I'm going to give you some examples. So there's that fern leaf beach of mine. <laughs> you can tell I like that tree. Um, here's that Stowe's pillar. It's right after we first planted it. So it's grown. Um, rounded, the most common shape. And it should be used most often in the landscape because as far as landscape plant shape goes, it's the white color of the plant world. It's the neutral color that goes with everything. Uh, so the rounded shape blends itself very easily with other plants. Um, can provide ample shade because the crown will, will widen out. Um, and rounded closes the space, especially when you allow them to be branched completely to the ground. Now this we don't allow to be branched completely to the ground. We keep it pruned up. In fact, we've pruned it up a little higher now so that we can walk under it. So we probably have the bottom of the tree pruned up to maybe about eight, nine feet, but it gives that grounded feel you're of connecting that space to the ground. Other forms of round, See if I can move this. Okay, that's better. Uh, the sugar maple. Sugar maples, uh, they have nice rounded forms. I'm showing you a Cleveland Select calorie repair with a rounded form. And in some instances, the Cornus Florida, the common flowering dogwood, can take on a nice rounded form. Here, another winter picture of an oak that's really showing off its round form. Oval, uh, oval again, can be kind of uh, up to the eye of the beholder, but it's usually upright with a single leader going up the center um, that branch out into this oval shape. Here I'm showing you a Crimson King Norway maple. Um, and on the bottom, I'm just showing you some pyramidal Bradford pears. What's nice about um, oval shapes or when we get into the pyramidals is that they narrow out up at the top. So if you did have power lines and you were planting this, you could space this so that as the crown grew, it wouldn't grow directly into the power lines, it would grow along the side of them. Um, it's more of an upright accent than round because it has that, um, that, that point shape to it. And it's, like I said, it's good when you have reduced space overhead. Then you have oval evergreens. This one definitely uh, probably cuts more of like, you might call it a bullet shape, but just look how tall that tree is. Those are grown men walking down at the base of it. And that, that's, its, that's its shape. This, this plant behind though, definitely takes on more of that pyramidal shape. So again, different shapes and how they work against each other. Pinus sembra is a Swiss stone, stone pine and it naturally grows in the oval shape. Just natural, um, I, I have several in my landscape and this is what they do. It's, it's their inherent shape and they grow very uniformly. Now, there's two terms that we have in the landscape in our jargon, and that's columnar and fastigiate. And I, in my opinion, that these terms have been jumbled in the trade. Uh, a columnar or fastigiate tree has high visual weight. It's going to be an upright, narrow growing tree. It's going to draw your eye upward. Um, in the landscape, the vertical, these strong verticals tend to dominate because they just point to the sky. They can block views, especially when you have uh, minimal uh, bottom space. Remember I showed you that first slide where they were up against that alleyway. 
Well, these have a smaller footprint, so they're not gonna take up that much space. Now with, with a columnar, it has a central leader, and then it has these short laterals that come up, often in a sweeping pattern like you see up here. This is actually a sweet gum, and this is slender silhouette. And here you can see they, they do dominate um, and they're, they're doing their job. And this picture on the left, very much framing the entrance to that home, very much accenting the, 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 the width of this house. I like that. On the right, uh, they are definitely uh, drawing your attention to the stained glass on the side of this building, framing it. Um, and you know, you can have different designers look at different things and, you know, we're all going to, you know, pick it apart. Um, I like this look. I just wonder what, what they have over here. I would like to see something a little bit more grounding over there, um, just so that your eye kind of follows, follows the line of the plants. And here they're blocking a view, their privacy. Um, these could be schmar guards, or they might, uh, I'm not exactly sure because I didn't um, take this picture, um, but they are arborvitae, they are upright columnar, and the bottom of those probably are taking up a footprint of maybe about five feet wide with maturity. So rather than having a standard arborvitae that can get 15 feet wide, here you have a smaller footprint. You need to put them, plant them closer together for the optimum um, privacy. Privacy. There's also one called De Groot Spire, and De Groot Spire is even um, narrower with even a smaller footprint. So then we have fastigiate. Um, fastigiate doesn't, they really describe it as not having a dominant central leader. And all of these are very sweeping up. When you see the silhouette of a fastigiate tree compared to a true columnar, which I'm gonna show you, you'll understand. Um, a lot of the branches originate lower and they just sweep their way up. Parallel to one another, kind of in a broom-like fashion. And also they, are a strong upright accent. So here we see Carpinus betulus ironwood, and you can find, you know, within a species different forms. So I'm showing you the fastigiata on the left, which says that sweeping upright narrow shape versus the straight species, which is on the right. So understand when they have that um, cultivar name or uh, variety name after it, because oftentimes that's telling you, um, some you know, what, what the shape could eventually be. So here, this is what I mean when we talk about um, a fastigiate tree. See how in the silhouette, they're just coming from the main branch and they're going upwards. Same with this one. They're just coming out of the center and the same with this one. So depending on the plant, they can get quite wide. Technically, this is columnar. Columnar has short branches that come out from the main trunk and fastigiate, they come up in that sweeping motion. Conical, again, moves the eye upwards. Uh, when we have conical and oval, again, all these things are open to interpretation, but good hedge plant where space is limited. This is, this is a smar guard or an emerald, and you don't need a lot of bottom space to get a good privacy fence. Uh, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about when you have lots of upright points, right? Just be leery of a lot of upright points. It tends to 
draw the eye away from what you want people to appreciate, and that's your landscape. So you have to have some things that are going to bring the eye down. Pyramidal, another striking accent. Um, very common, and I kind of put them in the neutral shape with the rounded. Uh, they're wider at the bottom with a main center trunk and horizontal branches. Uh, here, this I believe is a pin oak. And you really need to give them space because this base is going to get wider than the top. And you want to be able to appreciate that shape. That's what, that's what this plant is known for. Okay, when we think pyramidal, you know, we think um, Christmas tree shape. And here we have some pyramidal uh, spruces. This one has a little bit of ascending branch tips. This one doesn't, but they're still in that pyramidal shape. Uh, we have a Colorado uh, blue spruce right here. And this is a Picea pungens cestors dwarf. And then we have a Norway spruce in its full maturity, definitely in a pyramidal shape. Now let's talk a minute a bit, bit about what I mean by being leery of too many points. We've all seen homes like this. Beautiful homes, very interesting roof lines, lots of peaks, lots of architectural accent. And we see it in many shapes, many styles. So you've got points, 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 points. Okay. Here's another with multitudes of points. So I want to look at this picture and I started to know that, notice this several years ago uh, when homes that were built like this were maturing and so was their landscape. And I started to take note of what was back planted to the house. So what was starting to peak up over the roof line in the back? And what I noticed is if, if people planted a lot of conifers, evergreens, spruce, pines, all of that, well, what you started to see was points, kind of outlining points, and you lose the effect of that roof line, which, I'm sure was designed for that, that architectural impact. But now you have point after point after point and they get lost versus if they came in and they used just rounded trees in the back. Now, I hope you can see this, those points become that much more noticeable. Okay? They, they really stand out versus competing with the other points. So this tree, uh, this house, you can see in the back, that's what's starting to happen. You're starting to get that rounded form and it's really going to back frame that house nicely as it matures. Now this is up at Hidden Lakes in Michigan. This is a display garden. This was, um, a uh, garden donated by a friend of mine, Chubb Harper, who's passed away. And this is a garden designed to show people what conifers can do. So you're seeing lots of shapes. Uh, we have pyramidals, we have low rounded, we have some ground covers. Um, so you can see how they, you know, can really take the eye away from your lower landscape. But again, this is a display garden. So I just wanted to point that out. Spreading. Spreading makes a good background, uh, fills the airspace. It's strong visual weight. Uh, and again, you could, you could consider them a, a, a neutral. There on the bottom, you're seeing uh, just a majestic oak with its crown spreading out. Uh, the other on the uh, right is a Japanese snowbell. It's a Styrex. And for those of us in the north, we struggle with this because of the cold. But in the southern part of the state, this does very nicely. It has um, white pendulous flowers and a nice uh, broad spreading rounded crown and a good fall color. 
here, this is spreading. This is a, um, a mimosa or albizia, not my favorite tree, but I think it got, is a good example of the spreading shape. And what we mean by filling the airspace, it, it stretches the uh, horizontal uh, view of that tree. So it fills that space. I can actually stretch out a space and give you the illusion that it's, it's wider than it really is. Open. Okay, open. Again, now we're starting to get into some vague terms. It's just an open, irregular shape. You can't really say that it's uniformly rounded or uniformly pyramidal or uniformly cone-shaped. It's just irregular. And what's nice about these, uh, since they're irregular, they don't usually have a tight crown. So you have dappled shade and dappled sunlight underneath. So it's not a heavy, heavy shade tree. So you usually can keep a good stand of grass growing underneath it. And they really do have a softening effect in the landscape. Um, this is a honey locust. This is Gladitia trichanthus sunburst. Horizontal, we already showed um, some horizontals in the beginning. I showed you the cornice Cusa. This is another cornice, a dogwood, but this is alternate folia. Uh, it's the only um, dogwood that has alternate foliage. That's why it's called alternate folia. But as you can see, it has strong um, horizontal branching. So it really stretches that space. It's a comfortable form because the direction that those branches go naturally correspond with the movement of our eye. It's low visual weight, um, meaning it's, it's not that much of a, of, a, of a standout, but it offers that horizontal view. It's comfortable. And as I said, it can stretch the space, um, the space in between versus if this was just an upright, it, it's not gonna fill that wall uh, without having to plant more of them closer together. Then we have a regular, really no exact shape. Uh, and some of these trees are really nice. Uh, they add a unique dimension to the landscape. Uh, black locust, that robinia shape. I mean, it's just irregular and up against that blue sky. Uh, that's just, that's just to me, just very attractive. The lower picture is a gymnocladus. That's a Kentucky coffee tree. Oftentimes in the landscape, we, we refer to plants as having a coarse texture or a fine texture. These would definitely be a coarse texture plant. And then catalpa. You know, I am really happy that I'm starting to see catalpas uh, available in the trade. They kind of lost favor, but they really are a lovely tree. Uh, there you see it uh, in bloom and uh, on the left and on the right, you're just seeing it uh, later on in the season. They're gonna be large trees and they do get the pods, they can be messy, but you know, we talk about diversity and we don't want to have monocultures of, of one type of plant. Look what happened with emerald ash or uh, wiped out all our ash trees because they were so commonly planted. So by having some of these trees that are more uncommon, we're helping with diversity. And then what I like about this catalpa is in the winter, when it drops its leaves, it has this wonderful shape. You can see how irregular it is, it's coarse, but then it has those branches. And I want you to compare it right here is a pin oak, right? Very pyramidal. I can tell, I can, I can do a drive-by on a pin oak in the winter time because it's pyramidal and the lower branches start to bend outwards. But there, side by side, you're seeing two different shapes. Vase, oh, vase shape we all, I always think of the American elm because this picture here is a, is a beautiful uh, vase shape to it. Um, and that would be very similar to what the American elm would do. It, it's graceful. It opens up the space beneath it. it. It's more inviting and it's perfect for lining as you see this, this country road or a walkway because it's not going to interfere with whatever business has to be conducted underneath because it goes up, it arches, and then the branches don't 
really get into that, that workable space. It offers shade and headroom. And here, this is um, an American elm and in the wintertime, and you can really see that that's what it was grown for. Uh, a line of American elms down a street on both sides and how the vase shapes that the outer tips would meet in the center over the street. It was just a lovely, lovely site. But again, we um, planted them. They were very, very popular. And then we got Dutch elm disease. And because we didn't have diversity, they were wiped out fairly quickly. So other vase shaped plants, upper right is Chiodanthus virginicus, American fringe tree. Uh, in, in my opinion, the one I have in youth, it is a distinct vase shape, um, but now as it's getting older, it's getting a rounded crown, but the base of it still has that vase shape to it. The one below it is Alcova green vase. That is extremely vase shaped. This was actually, they did a lot of research with this because of its shape uh, to replace the, the American elm to see if they could get something that would have that graceful arching to it. And the picture on the right, for those of you that have ever been in the Southern states or uh, live, uh, have ever visited during the summer, this is a crepe myrtle. It's a Lagostromia species. And they're beautiful trees. They bloom beautifully and they take on this wonderful base shape. Now, for those of us in or Northern Illinois, crepe myrtles are not winter hardy, but there are some shrubs that we can plant and they burn down in the winter because of the cold, but the roots stay alive and they'll come back as a blooming shrub. Usually the ones I had maybe four or five feet, but they would give me a nice bloom. Weeping, boy, weeping, those flexible long branches that hang down may touch the ground. They're often a regular shape. This is a weeping beach. And I took this picture um, in Bruges, Holland along one of the canals. And that, that tree is a focal point. That tree just stands out. And this was early on, it was just starting to leaf out. And I'm sure it was just as beautiful and as graceful when it was in full leaf. It's not a good street tree uh, because if it leaps to the ground, you're going to have pedestrian interference, you know, cars going through, you would have to limit up. You could still have it, it just you wouldn't have that full effect of the weeping all the way to the ground. And again, this, this pulls your eye down. It, it doesn't have that point that leads your eye, but as you see it, your eye is drawn down. So some other weeping habits, there's that larynx on the left and it is grafted um, on uh, probably about a five foot standard so that it starts weeping at about five feet. This is Siberian pea shrub, Carrigena arborescens walker, very cold to tolerant and definitely a weeping shape. We see a lot of weeping um, flowering cherries and flat flowering plums. Again, for us up in extreme Northern Illinois, sometimes the booming can be a little iffy if we have a really cold winter or a cold snap. Now, my favorite shapes, <laughs> I'm kind of partial to the odd ones. Uh, I kind of like the tall, upright, uh, skinny ones. This is that uh, weeping white spruce, Picea uh, glauca pendula, and they can get quite tall. They can get quite tall. Um, ours probably is now getting close to 20 plus feet tall, and it's withstood windstorms, well, winter blizzards. They're pretty strong trees, and it is a nice accent. This is what I mean by the skirt. As it matures, it starts to form what we call a skirt with those lower branches that uh, kind of spread out. Okay, another weird upright. This is Green Arrow. It's a Camociparis, Camociparis newcontensis. Sometimes it's listed as Xanthocypris. It's upright, it's skinny, but no two are the same. And they will throw off these odd arms 
Uh, so they really do uh, take on a very dramatic uh, look to them be because they're all different and you're never really sure what they're going to do except be tall and upright with these weird arms. This is bronze, Pendula bronze. This is a, a spruce. This is a tree that, again, no two are going to be the same. The base is going to start out as that, uh, that columnar shape. Then the top can go wonky either way. The one that we have, um, we think it's looking more and more like an elephant getting a trunk, but who knows? Who knows what it'll look like in a year? This is a little, um, this is Russian um, arborvitae or Siberian cypress. This is microbiota decusata. And again, a nice weeping shape to it. This was grafted. So the graft is about three and a half feet up and it's weeping to the ground. Um, behind it here, you see some other shapes, but trust me, those are man-made. This is a beach. This is a European beach and it's tortuosa. Um, we have several tortuosas on our property. This is the green. And we just let this one go. We just let it decide to do its own thing. It has a very contorted shape to it. Um, and we've, we've cleaned out the center. We've pruned out the center of it. Oh, I apologize. And uh, we have it illuminated. So in the winter time, when it's just the branches, you see the light coming through it. And it's really very, very um, eye-catching. Now notice, we didn't try to cut the plant back to fit the space. We just said, okay, it's getting wider and we're gonna start killing out that grass and just extend the bed. And here, these are um, also contorted beaches. They're hard to photograph. Um, this one here, uh, they, as I told you in the one before, we just let it go. Uh, what you can do is you can choose the central leader and you can um, stake it so that that central leader grows to whatever height you desire, take the stake off, and then it's going to start to take on its oddball shape. Uh, here, this is one, again, they pruned out the center of it, and this is the, the structure that you see in the winter. So here, this is back in our yard. You saw this picture earlier. This is um, our purple contorted beach. We trained that up to about 15, 16 feet, stopped staking it, and now we're just letting it do its thing. And here it is, it's hard to photograph, but I got this um, after a light snowfall, and it just accentuates how these branches are coming out and um, forming its, its, its own structure, its, its own shape. I like Kentucky coffee trees. Yes, they're big, bold trees, but look at that winter silhouette. It's very coarse against that winter sky. Just, just really, really um, stunning um, to have that, especially when you can see that out a window during the winter time. Walnuts, black walnuts. They also have a coarse, interesting winter silhouette. Now this is, we talked about fastigia and columnar. This, this is technically truly um, columnar where it just gets these thin little spurs that are coming off of it. Here you see one in this landscape. I want one of these. I really want one of these in my landscape. Um, it's a maple and it takes on a beautiful color in the fall. Now he is not topping that. He is not topping that. What he is doing is he is trying to take some side tips so that he can graft them and see genetically if this trait will carry on. So he's going up high and he's just snipping off some buds, He'll probably come down here next, just snipping off. There's not a lot of growth there, maybe snipping off a uh, half an inch to an inch and then grafting it onto um, different types of desirable rootstock and growing it on. 
but that that's that's pretty much an extreme of a, a um, upright weird plant in the landscape. Uh, we talked a little bit about black locusts. There's several in the trade. The one on the left is called Twisty Baby, and it just gets this contorted, twisty shape to it. And the one on the left is called Lace Lady, where it's more of a pendulous, and it does, it takes on this, this lacy effect. And we didn't really talk a lot about um, shrubs or bushes, but these are the things that pull our eyes down. I'm showing you um, some different types of junipers. Mother load juniper is the yellow on the upper left. And again, that's going to draw your eye down. It's going to hug the ground. Also, it has that yellow color, which will help uh, uh, root your, your view down to the ground. Andorra junipers, blue star, just showing you that there's different colors, different textures that will help you get that sense of grounding in your landscape. So I'll leave you with this picture. This is our eastern border. And uh, fortunate to have the backdrop of my neighbor's windbreak. This is a small, um, oh, I apologize again, I keep doing that. This is a small um, uh, Korean maple that has a nice rounded shape. It probably won't get much bigger than that. We've had that probably for about 20 some years. This is a um, beach. It is a uh, Hesigia columnar beach called Dawick, and this was Dawick purple. Here you're seeing the back of that gold rush that I showed you earlier. This is the fall color of that cornice Cusa with the horizontal branching. Down here to kind of root the colors of this garden, uh, we have uh, blue star junipers. And then right behind me, we put in an ornamental grass just for some different textures and colors in the landscape. So I, I, hope, I hope you've gotten something out of this. Uh, it's, it really does make you look at your landscapes differently. And maybe it will make you think about what plant you want to put where and what shape you want to have it. So that's the end of the program. And Nikki, do we have questions? We don't have questions at this point, but if it's OK, we'll give people a minute to type questions into the chat box or unmute themselves and ask a question of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that great presentation. <laughs> I love it that you highlighted some of my favorite trees. Now, I mean, you talked a lot about Kentucky coffee tree, and I know we have a couple of great specimens up here in Freeport, but it's not really something we see for sale um, in the garden centers very often. Do you know um, where there's sources in the industry that we can buy such a thing? Well, the, there's sources out there. I mean, you can pretty much get anything through, um, you know, mail order. Um, I or, we order some of our oddball trees through mail order just because we can't find them, but you're not going to find anything of size. Uh -huh. I am noticing more in the trade. We're starting to see some of these trees. Um, my husband and I, we, we buy trees and donate them to our city because we, we want to see diversity. And in the last couple of years, we've picked up um, a Kentucky coffee tree. We picked up one called Espresso. We picked up um, a Catalpa. Um, just, some, just some more unusual. Uh, usually it would be, I, I'm not familiar with what you have up in Freeport, uh, but the more you ask for these things, the more nurseries and garden centers are um, going to go out and look for them. Uh, some of the oddball trees we pick up, I don't know if in Princeton, there's a place called Hornbakers. Oh, uh-huh. They have unusual trees. Um, oh, there's one in Rockford. It's, it's, oh, I can't think of it. It's on, is it? Oh, I can't think of it. There's a, there's a tree place. Um, yeah, I think I know what you mean. It, in Village Green is the only thing coming to mind and I don't think that's it. No, this is um, kind of on the southeast side. 
Oh, it's just it's just escaping me. Um, but they're a tree nursery and they're known for their Carl Carlson Growers. Carlson? Yep. Carlson Growers. That's it. Yeah, That's uh, it. New, Newberg. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. They have a, they have a, a lovely selection of all sorts of things. I've I've picked up some oddball things there. So you know, sometimes it's just getting out and about and traveling. Um, good road trip with some friends to go and find some some new places. Uh, but again, demand will kind of dictate what is being grown. Yeah, good point. There, there's a question. Um, your thoughts on columnar Norway maples? Um, fine. I'm not sure what they're, they're really ask. I mean, um, if that's the shape that you're looking for, there is um, some issues with uh, Norway maples um, receding. Uh, so if that would be an issue, um, I know that some people have kind of turned away from planting Norway maples. I personally like them in the landscape. Um, it would it would be fine. It's a Norway, so it's not um, known for its speed of growth, which is good because that slower growth brings in um, stronger wood. So if you can find it, sure. Um, and then Lisa's asking, how wide does the Picea glauca pendula get? Well, I talked about the skirt on the bottom. So with age, it's going to get, it's just, it, it, it's a skirt that just comes out and it kind of lays around along the ground. Um, gosh, the one we have, um, that bottom footprint, I